This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek, and we're with Maleko Pakedi. He is Deputy General Secretary of the South African Federation of Trade Unions. So welcome to Workweek, Maleko. Good morning to you, Steve, and good morning to your beautiful uh, viewers. So today you've been having a general strike in South Africa called by your union and other organizations. Why don't you talk about the issues that led your union to call for a general strike in South Africa? We're the second biggest federation of trade unions. We organize workers across all sectors of the economy. For quite some time, we have been dealing with questions of inequality, poverty, rising unemployment, and corruption. And all this have been affecting the workers in their respective workplaces, but have also been affecting workers at their community where they stay. So SAFI then has taken a decision that it needed to confront this onslaught on workers. It needed to push back the repressive, oppressive, and exploitative practices that we find ourselves in. Workers' rights are under a bit of an attack. That's one of the demands that we are raising, that workers have got the right to organize themselves, they've got the right to participate in legal strikes, uh, they've got the right to, for that matter, bargain collectively and enter into collective agreements. So of lately, there have been disregard of that right and an attack directly at it. Secondly, it has been about the economy, our economy for quite some time has been an economy that has been on a downright spiral. And as a result, there have been little done by government to respond to the dire needs of our people. The least that government have been doing have been succumbing to the international monetary financial institution or the financial institutions such as your IMF, your World Bank. They have been um, uh, acceding unnecessarily so far as you are concerned to the rating agencies and they've been uh, compromising to the multinational corporations on issues that we believe are pertinent. So we've been pushing back that. Last issue that is quite critical has been issues of jobs and of course, basic services. That we are a country that is sitting with 32% of unemployment rate on a narrow definition, but 42% on an expanded definition of employment, uh, unemployment. So as a result, there are, we felt that we cannot take this anymore. Hence, we took up to the street uh, this, this today. Well, the issue of COVID, how has COVID affected uh, the uh, Af South African working class? And what has been the policy of the government, the ANC government, to deal with the pandemic and uh, the virus and the effect on working people and the public? There's been an attempt by the government to try and use COVID as it is the problem maker within our situation. And we want to reject that narrative because we believe things have been messed up before. It's just that during the COVID pandemic, things have gone quite worse. Uh, the state of disaster was declared and it gave government the latitude to basically uh, think of a situation wherein a constitution will likely be suspended. We don't subscribe to that view. We believe that we should be responsible. We believe that we should be careful in ensuring that we don't increase the spread of the virus, but we don't believe that government should use that as a means and ways of oppressing workers, as means and ways of allowing capital or other big businesses to now unduly retrench workers, to now unduly exploit workers on the basis of the situation. Workers who have been what we call the frontline workers, those in the healthcare, those in the public safety, have been most exposed because one issue we have been dealing with has been the question of access, access to PPE. And, and that has been an issue that has been quite a burning issue for us because we believe that corruption have denied workers their rightful protective equipment during the course of the work. But yes, we have lost about 2.2 million jobs as a result of the pandemic in South Africa. There is an economic reconstruction and recovery plan which we have rejected because we believe it does not address the situation that confronts us. And as a result, the we have demanded that government find the means and ways to come with a better plan that will take us out of this situation. And we're speaking with Maleko Pakide. He's the Deputy General Secretary of the South African Federation of Trade Unions. One of the critical issues, not just in South Africa, but in the United States and around the world, is privatization, contracting out, outsourcing. What is your concern uh, and the concern of the workers of South Africa about the policy of the ANC in relationship to privatization <clears throat> and outsourcing? For one reason or the other, ANC have adopted new liberal policy uh, program, which we don't know uh, where such come from. They had had their conference in 2017, we would have thought that some of the resolution they adopted 
will inform government policies. But unfortunately, they are not. We would have thought that they would have a state bank. We would have thought that they would have looked into the mining sector, particularly the deportation of raw material and see into the control and ownership of the mining sector. We have thought that they will dismantle what is happening in our financial services sector. More so, we thought they will also do the same with the energy. But what you are seeing is the opposite. Actually, government is now on a program of uh, privatizing our state-owned enterprises. They are now quite um, driven with, I don't know, vigor to try and privatize ESCOM. Hence, they are splitting it into three, uh, commissioning, distribution, and for that matter, generation, something that we completely reject. We know that there are attempts to privatize SAA, the challenges that SAA, our South African airline have been, have been quite there for quite some time. But we are quite clear that there is nothing other than privatization that has been driven. Government have decided not to continue to spend more on public services. And as a result thereof, we believe they are deliberately creating a space for the public, I mean, for the private partners. If you have regard to what is happening in the healthcare system, our healthcare system is allowed, so far as we believe, to collapse such that the private players can literally get into that space. The same applies in our education system. For quite some time, we've been fighting that we need a, 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 a system of education that is quite quality, that is quite decolonized, we argue, but that is quite accessible. But if you look at what government has been doing, have been too little to a point where we believe they are deliberately creating space for the private sector. The reality of the matter, we believe, is that they have submitted, they have submitted themselves to the, uh, 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 the, the terms and conditions of uh, a, a structural adjustment from the IMF if you have regard to the recent loans that they've been given to our country. And that is why they are suddenly pushing the austerity budget. They are suddenly pushing privatization program. And we are completely opposed to that and will continue to reject that. You would appreciate the situation with regard to the vaccine uh, storage and distributions. We have been saying it can't just be correct because if you tie and put that in the public hands, you are breeding corruption. And that's what we are seated with. And where corruption plays itself is the poor of the poorest that suffer the most because the very same services or the very same goods that's supposed to reach them does not reach them as a result of looting thereof. So ANC is in a complete disastrous, uh, economically speaking and socially speaking, uh, policy trajectory. And for that matter, SAFT decided not to keep quiet but to challenge that state of affairs. And one thing that has happened uh, with this pandemic in the United States is a massive transfer of wealth. The billionaires, Bezos, Elon Musk, it seems that the, uh, the billionaires are profiting massively from this uh, pandemic. Is that the same situation in South Africa? It is largely the same. It is largely the same for one reason or the other. We have seen big businesses making quite some serious profit. Uh, one, they did so because they have been left to do whatever they want to do for argument's sake. If you have regard to our uh, basic food staff, we are a poor country so far as we are concerned. We have poverty, but the fact that we had COVID-19, you had these companies increasing basic food prices, in some instances tripling them. And our competition commission have been quite asleep. It's only now that they are waking up to the reality and they are trying to do something about it. So I can assure you that indeed the situation is not much different. Here in South Africa, it's worse because we've got weak legislation that deals with that. One aspect that we have been dealing with over the past period of time and we are still dealing with, it has been the question of illicit financial flow. We are losing hundreds, billions of rents towards that and least have been done to do that. The other thing that has made our situation worse is that South African corporates are paying less tax. I mean, 28 or so percent, whereas uh, uh, private individuals are paying tax up to about 40%. And as a result thereof, they have been quite literally on, on a holiday so far as we are concerned. And the situation is exacerbated by the fact that list is done by our government to address it. Today, we were receiving the budget speech from the finance minister. And standing here, I can tell you, the only thing he did was to beat more those who are employed and those who are poor and to appease the capitalist class of us who are concerned with we have regard to the budget speech that he delivered this today. And in Argentina, even, they passed a capital tax uh, on the, the wealthy to pay for the COVID crisis. It seems like the ANC, which calls itself a socialist or workers' uh, government, is not interested in going after the billionaires who are profiting from COVID. Is that the case? 
is the case, but partly must accept that within the ANC, probably there are two capitalist factions that are battling its souls. So depending on which faction of the capitalist class is running or holding the levers of power, they will then try to drive a process of quick accumulation and do so at the behest of the government and its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its, its state and its apparatus. Here in South Africa, they have not necessarily uh, brought in a COVID tax. We have said to them they must tax the rich and they have not done so, which is an issue that you are seated with. We have said that uh, those who are sitting with investable, investable cash and they are not investing it, they must be put to uh, terms and conditions that they can invest, but nothing whatsoever have happened. You would appreciate that the president of the ANC is a multi-billionaire, a former trade unionist, we believe, but uh, for that matter, he's what he is. He's representing the class of his own and he's saving the class of his own. We have no confidence whatsoever that he's going to deliver anything for the working class of us who are concerned. It's just that we have got two factions of capitalists who are fighting for the, for the, for the part that they have. And that's the situation we are seeing. The ANC, so far as we are concerned, have long lost the... Uh, uh, socialist um, uh, uh, element, you know, yes, they may not have expressed themselves as a socialist organization, but they've always pride themselves as a pro poor pro working class organization. They are no longer saying that anymore. They are not talking about radical economic transformation anymore. They are not talking about the national development of our country and our people and our economy. It's just a matter of accumulation and making sure that the class that is ruling the capitalist class, they continue to amass. And in the process of amassing, they continue to consolidate what they have and where possible, they continue to ship it off the country without paying any tax. And that cannot be a situation that is sustainable so far as we are concerned. The ANC government is not helpful whatsoever. In the United States, there is no Labor Party. There's no Workers' Party. The unions continue to support the Democrats, which is a capitalist party uh, controlled by the billionaires. Uh, what is the situation politically in South Africa for the working class? Is there a mass working class political alternative for the working class in South Africa? There, there are. The, the, the recent past, we have seen 2019, for the first time, a Socialist Revolutionary Workers' Party that was participating in the election. It's a party that comes from one of our national metal, our, our affiliate called NUMSA, National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa. In 2013 or so, they will have embarked on a process towards establishing the Workers' Party, which they have done, and it contested elections. One issue that we have also uh, wished to bring up as the federation, we convened a summit of all working class formation, about 150 of them came together in 2018. They agreed that we need a new road, we need a new movement, we need a true representative of the working class. And it's a project that is uh, shaping up quite well. With time, we'll be able to talk to that situation. The reality of the matter is that as the federation, we don't have they believe that there is any party that is truly represent the interest of the working class. Yes, there might be other political party that from time to time will shout uh, slogans that are revolutionary, slogans that are socialist. But you, 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 you pause to question whether or not they are truly, truly for the working class or not. And you would appreciate the fact that they do that once they are in the election campaign, post-election, they care less about the situation that affects the workers and the working class. We believe that the working class in South Africa is its own, its own. It must organize, unite, and it must champion its struggle to its own logical conclusion and ensure that we have a socialist South Africa. Mm -hmm. SAFTU is quite inspired by such kind of a political setup. But the situation is changing quite gradually, I can tell you. And today, during your general strike, uh, the leadership of the Cape Town branch of uh, soft to was arrested. There's increasing repression. There are murders of homeless who are trying to organize. What is the state of repression uh, against the workers, against homeless and other uh, uh, working class people in South Africa? Steve, I'm in the Northwest. I was deployed there myself. The capital of Northwest province is called Mahikeng. About 200 kilometers away from here is Rustenburg, our mining dominion area. In Rustenburg, we have a little a town or area called Marikana. You would appreciate that some 2012, there was quite a bad situation there. And the situation in our view by simple definition is a situation wherein workers who would have organized themselves, united and take up an action against their employer demanding what is rightfully theirs. But for one reason or the other, those with political powers who would have find means and ways to use the state apparatus, in this case, the police, to murder workers who were on a strike action demanding that. Yeah, yeah, today we're questioning 
we were cautioning the political powers and the policing department in Northwest to say we can't see that. They were quite uh, uneasy with us and a bit hostile. We are very disappointed and we condemn what happened in Western Cape. Our provincial secretary and one of our affiliate provincial chairperson were assaulted and arrested, thrown in the back of the police, been taken to a police station. Having embarked on a legally sound march, mind you, some last week, the ruling party's own secretary general was appearing in a court for allegations of charges of fraud, racketeering, and yet they had about hundreds and thousands of people who were gathering there picketing and nothing whatsoever happened. So far as we are concerned, there is a political play that is quite unfortunate, that nothing happened to those who were gathering there. But poor workers in South Africa are exercising their rights, who are following the law and the procedures are being treated this way. We condemn that. And we believe it's something that cannot be that cannot be allowed. I mean, uh, left unattended in South Africa. Yes, the state continues to use it. Um, uh, 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 I mean, the government continues to use state apparatus to assert itself. You will remember that during the early times of our lockdown last year, a fellow was shot down. May he soul rest in peace in one of the Alexandra township by the by the army uh, for just nothing because there was a feeling that they are not complying. Uh, with the regulations, but the situation is quite unfair. Last uh, week or so, you had beach goers in the Western Cape or the coast then, who went out to the beach in spite of the fact that the president would have said no one should go to the beach. But because those are the wealthiest in our country, they are on the, uh, on the, on the beach side, police did absolutely nothing. But here we are on a protected action. Here we are having followed the legal processes and suddenly we have been dealt with for handing over a memorandum to the Minister of Finance. We truly condemn that kind of action and will not necessarily take it lying low. The Federation is taking, is taking legal steps to deal with that issue. And the issue of uh, uh, systemic racism, the attacks on blacks in the United States, blacks and brown are shot down by the police uh, uh, every day. Um, and even under Obama, uh, the police terror would continued. And, the situation in South Africa, you have a, a black president of South Africa, uh, you have black uh, uh, administrators of the ministries, yet it seems there's a racism again continuing in South Africa. Is that the case? The system remains the same. The color might have changed, uh, but the system remains almost the same. Uh, you still have a system whereby a black person does not, particularly of, 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 of African uh, 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 grouping, does not enjoy the, the justice, uh, the benefit of our democracy, so to say. And, and that's the reality of the matter. I want to make a simple example. The discrimination based on race does not play itself purely and nakedly. It's just a matter of what you can and you can't afford. That's why we keep on fighting the situation of the two-tier system we are seated with. The rich and the poor, that's how it plays itself out. And that's how it has been allowed. The government have decided to preside over this racial system. They have presided over this situation of the economy, they fail to transform it. And as a result thereof, the, the ability to pay is being used deliberately. If you can't afford to have a private security by your house, you can't install security measures, you'll be a victim of uh, backlary and crime. The police will do quite little or nothing to your matter. If you don't have money to afford to buy private uh, uh, health care, i.e. medical aid, you will die at our hospitals not being attended to. If you don't have the money to pay for a private education, you'll get a substandard education. That's how it's playing itself racism. That's how it's playing itself uh, uh, discriminatory within South Africa. But the reality of the matter is that you are still seated with workers who are facing serious acts and forms of uh, racism at their workplaces. You are still sitting with gender uh, discriminatory practices at the workplace. In South Africa, we are still having a situation whereby a woman worker is earning at least half of his of, of, of what her male counterpart is, 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 is paid for. And indeed, racism has not disappeared. It has just become a bit unsystematic, but it plays itself in quite a subtle way, uh, uh, so far as we are concerned. And least have been done to address that situation. And so we are saying as SAFT, we must deal with racism. We must deal with all forms and uh, kind of, 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 of homophobia, so to say, and xenophobia that plays itself. But it's how it has been now sophisticated into a matter of whether you can or you can't afford. You know, people won't say to you, don't, don't come and stay here. 
They will say, can you afford it? People won't say to you, don't enter here. It's about that aspect. And unfortunately, the reality sits with us that we're still facing racism. Yeah. The white, I mean, let me just make one point. Uh, so, 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 let me just make one point about the agricultural sector. In the Northwest, we were responding to this question today. We were saying it can't just be correct that in the agricultural sector, the white farmers continue to beat up the farm workers who happens to be black. The white farmers continue to evict this and throw them by the road and nothing is said. What we hear of from farm, farmers organization, what we hear of from government is the death, which of course we don't necessarily condone, the death or killings of the white farmers as if the black farm workers are not human beings, as if the black farm workers' life and their families are less important. And those are some of the things that we are quite opposed to, and we have been very clear today raising them in our memorandums across the country. And your union has taken the initiative of calling for a general strike here in the United States. Richard Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO, actually opposed a resolution from the Vermont AFL-CIO calling for a general strike against a possible coup by uh, Trump, the president, uh, what kind of initiative do you think should be made internationally to get the world trade union movement, the workers' organizations globally together to act on a global basis uh, against this attack on the workers' class? It, it, is, it, it, it was interesting. I was, I, was, I was observing what was happening uh, in, the, in the, the U.S. with quite interest. Um, and one was saying here is an old democratic system and uh, it's facing quite similar challenges. Uh, you know, when people start to challenge the system, democratically speaking, when people start to do things like that, we start to get worried. What about our young democracy? That is only 30 years or so. But the, to answer your question directly is this. We are unfortunately a very young democracy. Trade unions exist as workers' organization within our constitution, within the laws of the country. And we have ratified a number of ILO conventions so far as that is concerned. And we have a signature to number of conventions on human rights. And we expect that to be followed and to be respected. But unfortunately, there has been a bit of a regress so far as our government is concerned. It has been attacking workers and human rights, particularly the rights to gather, the right to protest and petition have been under attack for quite some time in our country. And we are taking an issue with that. You would appreciate that as the trade unions, we operate in a very regulated environment here in South Africa, and I suppose it may be the case elsewhere. But we continue to pledge our solidarity with all our international workers and international uh, uh, trade union formations elsewhere, because we believe that their struggle is our struggle. We believe that United Workers uh, cannot be defeated. Cannot be defeated, and that's the issue that's supposed to be paramount as and when we are confronted with situations like this. Here in South Africa, we are definitely responding to that challenge. We are trying to unite with the federations that are there. There are about four federations in South Africa. We are trying to pursue them to agree to joint actions in response to that. We try to present a united front in responding to similar international struggles of workers, and we continue to release statements in support thereof. We continue to march to relevant embassies to demand that workers' rights and poor's rights are respected where possible. It's just that the COVID-19 has been quite of a distraction because some of these things have been placed under some serious restrictions. But we are saying injury to one is an injury to all. We are saying this is our struggle and it's a struggle of the workers internationally. And of course, solidarity is our slogan and our principle that we must live by. And one issue is the issue of investment of uh, China in not only Africa, but also in Latin America. There's a struggle going on now in Namibia, the Namibia Mine Workers Union, the Rossing Branch, where the mm -hmm. uh, owner, the China National uh, Nuclear Corporation has fired the leadership, the nine leaders of uh, uh, the union. Uh, what is your view on that and uh, the, the right of workers to organize whoever it is, whether it's a capitalist company or a government? What's your view in, of, of the Chinese in uh, Namibia and uh, in South Africa? Quite worrisome and equally um, the, an issue that needs to be attended to. An investment that brings about development, an investment that brings about economic growth, an investment that brings about job creation. What we have observed have actually been importation, importation of finished goods, importation of labor from China. And we don't understand what is that. We have actually seen a number of governments breaking backwards, uh, establishing police stations manned by Chinese police, 
allowing Chinese to have their own uh, place of residence. There, there are a number of questions that need to be answered about Chinese investment. Yes, time and again, they've been relieving some governments that are under financial strain, uh, giving some soft loans. You would appreciate that a while ago, African leaders would have went to China with their bowels and would have said, what is that that you can help ourselves with? We have asked the question, at least in South African context, what are the terms and conditions of this agreement entered into between our country and China? And how is that going to benefit us as workers and at least the working people in this country? And if that is not put forth, it creates a problem. We were one of those who were a bit uh, uneasy with free trade uh, Africa zone, because we are saying one thing, we are keeping the borders, they can't be human, I mean, they can't be, uh, the person-to-person -person free movement, but yet good capital is allowed to have free movement here within, within Africa. And these questions are not answered. And they're not answered in the manner that is not helpful. The situation needs to be further discussed, at least so that we come out quite resolute and say what is uh, the benefits of that. However, the, 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 the so-called counterfeit goods, the so-called uh, finished goods that have been put have not been helpful, have been quite disastrous. I mean, I can say the same with how we try to respond to the dumping of chicken, to the dumping of sugar in South Africa by other countries. And we can say the same towards uh, poor standard uh, goods that have been coming from China. We don't, we, don't, we don't understand why we should be saying it's an investment. Probably it is, but we still have to see the value and the impact thereof. What uh, words do you have to the American working class about the action that you've taken today in South Africa, your general strike? <laughs> We, we, we are saying human rights are not suspended. We might be under lockdowns. We might be dealing with a pandemic, but human rights are human rights and they must be respected. We have taken note of what government's responses have been. We believe that government's responses have been quite uh, biased to the capitalist class, multinational uh, uh, corporations, and have all been about uh, subordinating themselves to uh, IMF or World Bank loans. We have taken note of what has been happening with the World Health Organization, the question of vaccine, the question of, uh, of we've taken note of that. We believe that uh, human life should transcend everything and should remain supreme. We are saying as South African workers, organize yourselves as workers under the banners of trade unions, organize yourself under the banners of progressive principle uh, formation of the working class, but Unite, because that is what we have. Our unity then should be used to fight and fight back the onslaught and the attack on the livelihood of general working class population across the, the globe. And we are saying we are in solidarity with yourselves. We hope that you are in solidarity with us this side. Aluta Kontunua. Hey, well, thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking with Maleko uh, Patel. Thank you. He is the Deputy Secretary of the South African Federation of Trade Unions. And victory to your struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.